Episode 24, August the 27th, 1914. Toy Drum and Tin Whistle by Lieutenant General Sir Tom Bridges, KCB, KCMG and DSO. Read by John Winskill. To supplement Colonel Osborne's story of the grave state of affairs in St Quentin on August the 27th and the rallying of the troops by a brave and resourceful major, we are privileged to publish that officer's personal account of an immortal incident of the Great War. Sir Tom Bridges retired in 1922. Approaching St Quentin, the situation of the infantry became precarious. Marched literally off their feet, they straggled into the town in a demoralised condition. In the early afternoon, our brigadier had called the officers together, and said we were in a very tight corner, but must fight it out and die like gentlemen. He appointed me rearguard commander, with two squadrons and two companies of French territorial infantry in support. My orders were to hold the Germans off and retire through St Quentin at 6pm. I was not actually clear of it until six hours later. I made my dispositions and pushed out patrols to keep touch with the enemy. One of these, a corporal and three men, got cut off and joined a French cavalry regiment, but eventually found their way back to us a fortnight later. The Germans were slow in coming on. During the afternoon, a large grey car loaded with ladies came up onto a hill nearby and had a good look around. The car was so like a staff Benz that we thought the sex of the ladies doubtful. We sent a patrol to investigate, but it quickly turned and was gone. The Frenchmen were dug in on a rise north of the town, a nice position with a clear field of fire. I arranged with the Commandant that he should stay there until 4pm, but after visiting the outposts and returning at about 2pm, there was not a pair of red trousers in sight anywhere. This was my first experience of Allied cooperation. The French, in spite of their gallantry and inherent military qualities, were often unreliable and unpunctual. It may be that their methods were different from ours. They came and went like autumn leaves. Where we would hold a position, they would abandon it and retake it with a brilliant counter-attack and l'heure militaire, inexorable for le déjeuner, seemed meaningless in operations. One had to remember that Marianne was a woman, and would keep you guessing. Heroic in danger, she would run from a mouse. She would rise to the heights and descend to the depths, like the prophet Habakkuk. She was a capable de tout. Our interpreter officer Harrison of the 4th Hussars went into St. Quentin to find out if the infantry were clear, as, barring an occasional solitary lame duck, they seemed to have ceased coming down Le Cato Road, a part of which we could see. On his return, he reported the place swarming with stragglers. He could find no officers, and the men were going into the houses and laying down to sleep. I then dispatched Sewell, Brigadier General Sewell, with some hefty henchmen, farriers and the like, to clear out the houses and get everyone into the marketplace. He was also to find the mayor and commandeer bread and cheese and beer for our men, who were now on short commons, and to have it put down ready by portions on the pavement outside the mairie, so that if we were pressed, as seemed quite possible, we should not have to waste time issuing rations. We gradually fell back into the town, leaving two troops and machine guns to hold the bridge over the river, there were two or three hundred men lying around in the place, and a few officers, try as they would, could not get a kick out of them. Worse, Harrison now reported that the remains of two battalions had piled arms in the railway station and that their commanding officer had given a written assurance to the mayor that they would surrender and fight no more in order to save the town from bombardment. I had to relieve the mayor of this document at once and sent Harrison back to tell the two commanding officers 
that there was a cavalry rearguard still behind them and that they must hurry up and get out. Apparently a meeting was then held and the men refused to march on the ground that they had already surrendered and would only come away if a train was sent for them. I therefore sent an ultimatum, giving them half an hour's grace, during which time some carts would be provided for those who really could not walk, but letting them know that I would leave no British soldier alive in San Quentin. Upon this, they left the station and gave no more trouble. I quote this unpleasant incident to show to what extremes good troops will be driven by fatigue. I conducted these negotiations through an intermediary as I knew one of the colonels well and had met the other, and they were, of course, both senior to me. The men in the square were a different problem and so jaded it was pathetic to see them. If one only had a band, I thought, why not? There was a toy shop handy which provided my trumpeteer and myself with a tin whistle and a drum and we marched round and round the fountain where the men were lying like the dead, playing the British Grenadiers and Tipperary, and beating the drum like mad. They sat up and began to laugh and even cheer. I stopped playing and made them a short exhortation and told them I was going to take them back to their regiments. They began to stand up and fall in, and eventually we moved slowly off into the night to the music of our improvised band, now reinforced with a couple of mouth organs. When well clear of the town, I tried to delegate my functions to someone else, but the infantry would not let me go. Don't leave us, Major, they cried, or by God we'll not get anywhere. So on we went, and it was early morning before I got back to my squadron. Our rear guard was unmolested by the Germans and it looked as if more haste, less speed might well have been the description of this part of the retreat. Both the colonels above mentioned were afterwards court-martialed and cashiered. One of them, Elkington, joined the French Foreign Legion and worked his way to a commission. He was badly wounded and received the Legion of Honour. For his gallantry in the field, the king reinstated him in the army and awarded him the Distinguished Service Order. The night of the anniversary of Sedan found us riding through the forest of Compiègne in the white moonlight with drawn swords ready to fall upon our enemy, who we were informed, quite inaccurately, had now surrounded us. There is no doubt, however, that the Germans were making strenuous efforts to round up the British. Hate was the motif of the hour. The word contemptible tickled the queer sense of humour of the British soldier and was a valuable slogan for the first seven divisions and no doubt gave impetus to recruiting. But this translation of the word is hardly a fair one. Insignificant would probably meet the case. Although we found a fleet of supply wagons in the wood with engines still running and other queer things including German soldiers in grey-green cut in half at the waist. I never knew how. Was it an illusion caused by the ground mist, or did I dream it, for I rode in a trance? We emerged into the open without further contact. It was a relief to halt at last within the defences of Paris, for even the most unimaginative were by that time wondering when and where the chase would end. On the doctor's advice, I got leave and borrowed a car to go into Paris and see a specialist about my face. Paris was a dead city. The shutters were up, the streets entrenched, and the government gone to Bordeaux. The specialist had a German name. He rubbed his hands and beamed on me. Our army has had a bad time, yes. The Germans were supermen. Paris would now surrender to them, and so on. The Battle of the Marne, already preparing, must have come as a shock to him. Time, he said, would heal my cheekbone. Oh,
Kapu. <laughs>